In this video, we're going to continue taking a look at where functions are continuous. So one of the main types of functions that you'll often see are the polynomials. And for polynomials, you'll know that they're continuous everywhere. So we can say that uh, they're continuous on all the real numbers or from negative infinity to positive infinity with the open brackets, meaning that they're not con um, the endpoints are not contained. Now, any rational function, it seems odd, but we also say that they're continuous, but wherever it is defined, so that is continuous on its domain. And we know that it's not continuous um, where we have division by zero. Now, the following types of functions are continuous at every number in the domains. So, of course, I've already stated the polynomial. And rational functions. Now remember, it's on its domain, so therefore we are assuming that it's not continuous where we divide by zero. And the same with root functions. So on its domain where the radical is positive if it's an even degree. And we also have continuous functions on trigonometric functions where it's on its domain. So here's a look at um, three of our functions. So we have, all of them look like they're rational, but if you take a look at the first one, I can actually rewrite this as f of x equals to 1 ninth x. So this actually is a polynomial. So we can say that f of x is a polynomial. So it is continuous. Um, on all the real numbers, or from inf negative infinity to infinity. Uh, the second one is irrational. So right now what we need to do, just so that we can see where the division by zero occurs, we need to do some factoring. So I'm actually going to factor the numerator, which becomes x minus 10 and x plus 2. And also I'm going to factor the denominator. So I have x minus 2 and also x plus 2. <clears throat> so when I simplify, the x plus 2's will cancel off, and I have x minus 10 divided by x minus 2. Now, this is a rational function, so I'm going to state that here. So f is a rational function, so it is continuous. on its domain which is and I'm going to write this out um, first because it is based on the denominator so from the denominator I can see that we have x squared minus 4 so I'm just going to write x squared minus 4 here for a sec. And we want to say that it can't be 0. Now, we don't usually write our domain like this, so I'm actually going to rewrite it. So we know from here that x, if I move the negative 4 to the side of x squared equals 4, square root both sides, and x cannot be plus or minus 2. But it can be all the other numbers. Now, if you want to take a look at the graph, I've used Desmos here so you can take a look. And you can see that there is an asymptote here at 2. And then at negative 2, you can't see it, but when I point my cursor here, I can see that at negative 2, it says undefined. So we know that um, x can also not be negative 2. All right. So we can write the domain that is continuous in all of these parts, or you can also write that it is continuous, and we can use our other notation, so negative infinity to negative 2, and then negative 2 to positive 2, and then 2 to positive infinity. Notice I use round brackets because the negative 2 and the 2 are not inclusive as part of the domain. Okay, in the last example, um, it is a rational function, 
So f is a rational function. Okay, so we have to check the denominator. So when we look at the denominator, we have x squared plus 3. Um, let's see when it equals to 0. It can't equal 0. But actually, we can't square root the negative 3. So this doesn't work because we can't square root a negative number. So because of that, actually there are no values where x would create a denominator of 0. So therefore, we say that f is a rational function. Um, it is continuous on all the real numbers or from negative infinity to positive infinity because the denominator cannot equal 0. So f is a rational function, but the denominator is never 0. All right. So we're now going to take just kind of summarize this. Um, so in the above example B here, the graph of f approaches 3. So how do I know that it approaches 3? So when I know that this, um, the x value here, it can't be negative 2 or positive 2. And actually, when I plug in negative 2 into my question here, so I'll show you this. So if I take this and I plug in negative 2, which is one of the undefined values that or create an undefined value, I get negative 2 minus 10 and negative 2 minus 2. So this gives me negative 12 divided by negative 4, which actually gives me positive 3. So that means that negative 2, if I look back at the graph, at negative 2, which is here, and I go up to my graph, it does look like it should be 3. So what we say is, as approaches 3, it is near x equals negative 2. But at x equals negative 2, there is a hole, as you saw in the graph. Now, you can plug the hole if you artificially define f of negative 2 equals 3. So then, f would be continuous at x equals negative 2. So we, we can actually kind of plug this hole in. Um, in this situation, we say that x equals negative 2 is a removable discontinuity. So this is another example of a removable discontinuity. Now, at x equals 2, where there was a vertical asymptote, it doesn't matter what we do. Um, when we define f of 2, it's always going to be an asymptote. So the function will still be discontinuous. So this value at x equals 2 represents an infinite discontinuity. All right. Let's take a look at one more example. Um, so here's a piecewise function here. And it's helpful to know, always know what the graph looks like. We can do this algebraically, but I also want to take a look at what the graph is. So when x is less than 0, um, I get y equals 1. So here's 0. I have y equals 1. So I'm going to draw a straight horizontal line here. It doesn't include 0, so I'm going to put an open circle. From 0 to 1, I get this absolute value of x, which we would call is a is V shape here. But we only get the v-shape from 0 to 1. So I'm going to draw this little line here. 0 is included, but 1 is not. So I'm going to put an open circle for now. And finally, we have when x is greater or equal to 1, we have x minus 1, all squared plus 1. So the vertex is 1, 1. So we have a parabola here that opens up like this. So 1, 1 is included. So now I can actually color this in. And we also have this point, and we have 2 over 4 up, and we also have this point. So I'm going to connect these to create my problem. So at which of these numbers is f continues from the right, from the left, or neither? So we can see that this graph is continuous everywhere except right here at x equals 0 because there is this what we call a jump discontinuity. So f of x is continuous on all the real numbers except at x equals 0. At x equals 0, 
there is a jump discontinuity. Now, however, we can see it's continuous from the right because there is a closed endpoint. Okay, so I can also say at x equals zero, it is continuous from the right, not from the left because of the open circle. Now, you don't actually have to draw the graph. So if you wanted to do this algebraically, um, what I would do is I would check at the points zero because that's where um, the piece is split up, and then also at one. So if I check at zero, here one, when x is zero here, our y value equals one. For here, when x is zero, y equals zero. So that's why you can see that at x equals zero, there's a discontinuity. We're also going to check y equals 1, or sorry, at x equals 1. When x is 1, we can see from the absolute value that y equals 1. In the second piece, when x equals 1, I plug in 1, 1 minus 1, all squared is 0, plus 1. We also see that y equals 1. So here, these are, uh, sorry, so these are the same. And when x is 0, you can see that our y values are different, okay? So because these are different, we have a discontinuity here at x equals 0. But when x is 1, y equals 1, which is the same. So at x equals 1, it is actually continuous. And that's a way that we can check algebraically whether the function is um, continuous or not discontinuous. All right. Now finally, we're going to skip that example. Um, the last part here, if f is continuous at b and the limit of g of x as x approaches a is b, but then I apply another function and say that g of x is going to be plugged into f, I can take that limit, whatever the g of x is, and which happens to be b, and plug it into the function f. So it's a little bit confusing, but in other words, if I have the limit of f of g of x, which is a composite, then we can actually find the limit of g of x first, and then get that value, and then substitute it for the x value for f. So this theorem is saying that a limit symbol can be moved through a function symbol if the function is continuous, and the limit exists. In other words, and the order of these two symbols can be reversed. So let's take a look at one example. So if you take a look at this one here, we have this polynomial, and then it's raised to the power of negative one-third. So instead of doing this negative one-third first, I'm actually going to rewrite this. I'm going to find the limit as x approaches 2 of this polynomial first, And then I'm going to raise it to the power of negative one-third. So when I do this, I'm going to plug in 2 into this polynomial. And I'm just going to plug it into my calculator. So I get negative 27. And now I'm going to raise it to the negative one-third. So then this, to get rid of the negative exponent, we're going to put 1 over negative 27 to the one-third. So notice that um, the negative on the 27 stays, but the negative on the exponent is gone. And now I can actually cube root my negative 1 over 27. And that becomes negative one-third.